the uh, needle uh, becomes heated and through application of radio frequency waves um, there is um, significant heat produced that will actually ablate or destroy that tissue within the nodule. This is the James Cancer Free World Podcast. I'm Steve Wartenberg, and my guest is Barbara Miller. Barbara is a surgical oncologist, and in episode 111, Barbara talked about advances in treating adrenal cancer. And today, she'll fill us in on radio frequency ablation, a fascinating, minimally invasive, and effective way to treat an array of thyroid issues, including cancer. Welcome back to the podcast, Barbara. Thanks, Steve. It's nice to be here. Yeah, the last time it was via Zoom, so it's good to do this one in person. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So I thought we would start off if you could explain to us exactly what the thyroid gland is and does and the kind of issues you see in it in patients. Yeah, sure. Um, so the thyroid is a, a important gland uh, for the body. It's kind of a helper uh, for all the organ systems in the body. It produces thyroid hormone, uh, which is stimulated by one of the other uh, glands in the brain. Um, and it's a butterfly-shaped organ that, st that sits kind of in the lower half of the neck, drapes over the trachea or the airway. Uh, you have a right side and a left side and a middle portion. Now I'm reaching them. Am I touching them? Can you touch them from, um, or are they too far deep yeah, in? Yeah, sit it sits under uh, three layers of muscle, and so kind of the muscles that go down the side are the, the borders on the outside. Um, so many times you can't actually feel it, and... Um, that presents a little bit of an issue sometimes is the thyroid nodules can develop in the thyroid. They can be benign or malignant, um, but many times we can't feel them. We actually can only feel about 5 to 8 percent, when in actuality, when you do imaging studies, you find them in up to 60 percent of patients. So there are many, wow. many thyroid nodules that are out there that we have no idea that exist. When you say we can't feel them, you mean doctors? Or just patients, or both? No, both. Um, so, so like I said, the, the body habitus of each patient is a little bit different, and it does sit deep in the neck. Many nodules are very small. They actually don't distort the shape um, of the thyroid gland, and so we, don't, we can't really feel them unless we can, you know, until we can see them with an imaging study. Like an ultrasound is usually the, the best study or the study that we prefer to evaluate thyroid nodules with. Sometimes... Um, especially with patients who go through the emergency department um, or have CT scans for other reasons. We'll pick them up on different types of imaging studies. Oh, okay, because there would be a secondary diagnosis from something else. But what symptoms would someone have that would lead either their primary care physician or a specialist to think or do a scan to determine if they have a thyroid problem? Right, so um, there's a couple different issues that go on. One is structural uh, in terms of development of a nodule, and sometimes those are palpable or the patient or the physician can feel them. Um, sometimes it causes um, difficulty swallowing. Uh, other patients will have issues uh, if they're lying down at night in bed and they're sleeping on one side or the other and they have a large nodule, sometimes it feels uncomfortable. Uh -huh. Um, so that so we pick them up in different ways from uh, actual what we call compressive symptoms. Um, there are many other symptoms that come along too, but um, beyond the structural component of this, there can be a functional component. And so patients um, may have signs or symptoms of hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism, where the thyroid hormone production is too low uh, or too high, and that causes different different symptoms in different patients. What what would those symptoms be for too much or too little? Um, well, low thyroid hormone can result in fatigue, uh, weight gain, a whole host of other symptoms, and those symptoms are often very uh, similar to um, very vague symptoms that many patients have. Right, so you know if I'm tired, uh, yeah, if I'm gaining just, weight, that right. kind of thing, a, a lot of patients will think first of, oh, maybe I have a thyroid problem, when ac in actuality, it's usually the thyroid is functioning just fine. Yeah, I bet half um, the people just listening to that th immediately thought, I'm tired all the time, yeah, but it's not wants, your thyroid. No, it's everybody not, wants the, to blame yeah, the thyroid, right, so we have to defend, <laughs> okay. spend much of our career defending the function of the thyroid. The odds um, are you didn't get enough sleep. 
<laughs> right, right, exactly. So and hyperthyroidism is a little bit different. People um, sometimes can have changes in their heart rate where they have um, palpitations oh. or rapid heart rate. Um, it can cause um, changes in hair. Um, it can cause weight loss. Um, occasionally in patients with chronic hyperthyroidism will actually notice fatigue. And so that's yeah. kind of a crossover between the two different types of thyroid dysfunction. Um, so a lot of different symptoms. Can you remove a thyroid? You can remove the thyroid, and there's medication. Um, just like patients who are found to be hypothyroid, the treatment for that is medication. Uh, so that's usually a pill that you take once a day, um, and that's often um, not too difficult to regulate. Um, but in some patients, they have other uh, disease processes where their thyroid hormone levels will fluctuate, and it can be difficult to maintain them at a, at a steady level. Okay, so for some of these reasons or a combination of the reasons you just described, a patient comes to you here at the James with one of these thyroid problems. So I think that we're starting to lead us into the radio frequency ablation, mm -hmm. but sort of describe who comes to see you, what their problems are, and then what you can do traditionally leading up into the um, radio frequency ablation, which is a really cool name, but I, I like that radio frequency <laughs> ablation. So, so what happens when people come to see you? Yeah. So as a surgeon, I see patients for a whole host of, of thyroid issues. Um, obviously we have benign nodules that are causing symptoms for patients that we treat. Um, you know, benign nodules don't necessarily need to come out, but if they're growing or they're causing compressive symptoms, then we certainly start to have that discussion that potentially surgery is, is an option for them um, to take care of that. Um, obviously, we're concerned about thyroid cancer. Um, so 95% of thyroid nodules are benign. We need to find those 5% well, that good, are yeah. cancers and treat those. Um, those traditionally have been treated with surgery. Um, and usually the outcomes are excellent for patients with thyroid cancer. So there are about 40,000 patients who will be diagnosed with thyroid cancer. It's around the 12th, 13th most common uh, thyroid cancer in the country. And it's actually is probably the fastest rising incidence. And some of that is due to the fact that we're doing so many imaging studies that we're picking up these very small thyroid cancers that we would otherwise never feel and never know that are there. Um, so thyroid cancer is another one. Um, and then we, we treat patients for functional thyroid disorders, patients who have hyperthyroidism. Um, sometimes patients undergo surgery for that, um, for what we call a single toxic nodule, um, where one nodule within the thyroid gland is producing too much thyroid hormone. Oh. Um, so that sometimes is treated surgically. There are other options for that as well, including nuclear medicine. Um, and then there are patients who have Graves disease, where it's the entire thyroid gland that's producing too much thyroid hormone. And again, there are a range of options for that too. So when you, when you see something that looks suspicious and they say, okay, this may be cancerous and not benign, what's the difference when you look at it? When we look at it with ultrasound? Yeah. Yes. yeah. So what we're looking for is we're looking to see if the nodule appears uniform. Um, if the outer rim of it appears regular or is it irregular or misshapen, does it look like portions of it are growing up or down um, into other structures? Um, that means cancer, the irregularities. It can. It oh, doesn't can. always. Okay. And so there's a spectrum of the imaging characteristics. And so really it, it takes um, a lot of uh, training and a lot of experience yeah. to become quite good at that. So the radiologists obviously do that, but the endocrinologists, endocrine surgeons over the years have gotten very good at that. Um, I think as a surgeon, I have the benefit of not only seeing patients pre-op and understanding what things look like, I get to see what they look like in the operating room, and then I get to know, you know, what the pathology was. And so all of that is constant feedback as to, you know, plays into, you know, the next patient you see to say, is this benign? Is this malignant? Um, and, uh, and so it's, we do ultrasound um, uh, in the clinic uh, at the time that we see the patient, um, and that um, really helps speed up um, uh, care for us um, because not only can we do an initial consultation, yeah. uh, we can do a you know, diagnostic ultrasound, we can make a decision, does this need biopsy or not? Many times we can do that the same day that we see the patient. Um, and then we have an answer back, usually in several days, from the pathology lab 
um, about whether or not it's benign or malignant. There's a third category called indeterminate that sometimes we need to do some additional testing on. Um, but that really speeds up the process of, of us seeing patients and making a definitive decision about kind of, you know, what the treatment needs to be for this particular patient. Okay, perfect. Now we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll talk about when the treatment needs to be a radiofrequency ablation, exactly what that is. You didn't choose cancer, but you can choose where to treat it. And when you choose the James at Ohio State, you're picking a team of experts who understand there is no routine cancer. You're opting for care from a highly specialized team dedicated to treating one type of cancer, yours. A team that studies the unique makeup of your disease to develop a personalized treatment plan. You're choosing our region's only comprehensive cancer center designated by the National Cancer Institute. Where more than 1,700 scientists are working on new treatments and new hope for every form of cancer. At the James, you're making the choice to have the most advanced treatments, many of which were developed right here. And you're choosing access to the James world-class clinical trials, dedicated support services, and an unmatched survivorship program to support your life after cancer treatment. You didn't choose cancer, but the choice of where to treat it is clear. We're back with Barbara Miller, and we're going to dive into radiofrequency ablation. So fill us in. What is it? Like, walk us through what it's used for and the actual procedure. Right. So radiofrequency ablation is something that's actually done um, usually in the office. It can be done in the operating room, um, but um, most surgeons uh, and endocrinologists and their radiologists who do it, most endocrinologists and surgeons will do these procedures in the office because the, the benefit is that the patient doesn't actually need general anesthesia for this. Um, and it's well tolerated with local anesthesia. Um, so it is into clinic and out of clinic, um, you know, usually within 30 minutes to an hour after the procedure or so. Um, so that is fantastic um, for the when patients. When you say, say local anesthesia, is it like the dentist one? You just get a little tiny shot or they rub it on or... Yeah, are, it's are an injection. It's, it's an, an inject injection. Um, so it's a little bit more than what you get at the dentist <laughs> okay, office. Yeah. Um, but the, the way that we set these up, um, you know, there are certain indications for the procedure. Um, so the patients that we're usually offering this to or considering this in discussing what, what the treatment options are, because there are always multiple options. Um, and so right now we're focusing on usually benign nodules. Um, the smaller the nodule, the more effective radiofrequency ablation is going to be um, because smaller nodules are usually contained within the thyroid. They're not necessarily pressing up against any important structures. Certain structures that we worry about um, in terms of um, potential injury or complications related to radiofrequency ablation include the trachea or the airway, um, the esophagus, the carotid artery and the jugular vein. And then there's, in particular, there's two little nerves that come up from the chest called the recurrent laryngeal nerves. And those make the vocal cords move back and forth. And all of those structures are also in play um, as potentials for injury or complications during thyroid surgery. And thankfully, thyroid surgery is very, very safe. The complication rates are very low, usually 1% or less. Um, other um, potential complications include some glands called the parathyroid glands, but that's usually not as significant as with, with surgery. Um, but we're focusing usually on benign nodules, um, uh, larger nodules, uh, because they may be pressed up against important structures. Sometimes we cannot um, ablate the very outer portion of that nodule, and so there's a potential for what we call marginal regrowth over time. So you're leaving some cell, you, we know that we're leaving some cells, most of the nodule will be ablated, and so often we're getting significant uh, decrease in size. Um, and to relieve compressive symptoms is often what we're doing this and for. And if it's benign, it's okay to leave yeah. a few cells, right? Right. Um, the potential, though, is that it can grow back ah, over the okay. future. So we do have to watch them in the future. Okay. Um, other indications include um, what we talked about, single toxic nodules that are causing hyperthyroidism. Um, usually if those are two centimeters or less, that has the best success rate, um, although larger ones can be considered. Um, small thyroid cancers, um, 
usually in the setting of somebody who um, uh, has a recurrence. They've already had a primary thyroidectomy or thyroid operation to take care of their um, cancer. They've developed a very small recurrence somewhere, um, either in the middle of the neck where the thyroid was, or potentially a little lymph node that's developed some evidence of metastatic disease in it. Those are highly selected indications for radiofrequency ablation, but people have been doing ethanol ablation and radiofrequency ablation for that for um, you know, over a dozen years or so. Um, it's becoming more in focus again because radiofrequency ablation is really taking, taking off. Um, in some situations, it's, we're doing or selecting radiofrequency ablation because patients are too sick to undergo general anesthesia, oh. right? So patients who have um, a high risk for undergoing surgery just from a physiologic standpoint or, or their heart and lungs are not healthy, um, we can do radiofrequency ablation on those patients. Um, as well. And then, you know, there are certain patients that we should not do this in. That includes patients that have pacemakers in um, and patients who are pregnant. Um, there are other contraindications too, um, but that's something to discuss, you know, on an individual base basis. When an intervention for thyroid surgery or for somebody with a thyroid issue is considered, um, we like to have those patients come see the surgeon so that we can assess the patient and understand their risk factors for each potential interventional treatment because surgery is different, radiofrequency ablation is different, ethanol ablation is different. Sometimes it's simply surveillance. Um, so there's a risk-benefit analysis that occurs um, when we see these patients. Okay. So you've determined that radiofrequency ablation is the way to go. What is it? How do you do it? Yeah. So um, what this entails is we insert under ultrasound guidance, we insert a very small needle uh, into the nodule. It's very similar to fine needle aspiration. Usually the fine needle aspiration needles are actually just a slight bit smaller, but um, not by much. Um, and then um, with application uh, using a you know small machine that sits on a countertop uh, in the room, um, the uh, needle uh, becomes heated and through application of radio frequency waves, um, there is um, significant heat produced that will actually ablate or destroy that tissue within the nodule. And so it's similar, some people may say, oh, it, it sounds like maybe liver ablation um, for uh, liver nodules, liver cancer, something like that. Um, yes, radiofrequency ablation has been used for many years for um, other indications throughout the body for the thyroid. It's just making its way. And the reason for that is that the the actual procedure is a little bit different rather than putting a needle down into a nodule kind of in the center of it, allowing that entire area to become heated because of the important structures and in particular those nerves that I talked about earlier. Um, we do um, the procedure in a way, it's called the moving shot technique. And so we're continuously moving the needle and usually when we're ablating a nodule, we're starting with the very, very deepest portions um, and then moving our way up. Um, and because as you ablate, um, it becomes difficult to see um, beyond where you've ablated. Uh, um, so, you so we have to start, start deep the and then we kind of move more anterior and then we move from inferior to superior um, along the neck. And so we're constantly moving that needle um, so that we're reducing the risk of thermal injury or heat induced damage um, to surrounding structures. So you're moving the needle out the way, the reverse of it's way. It's moving when, in and out. In, as, oh, as in and out. Yep. Okay. So. And, and again, that comes with expertise to figure out exactly how to move it in and out where and when and and why right yeah it's a little bit different than with with other disease so, processes so radio frequency ablation is, is not new it's fairly new and it's being used more like what's the next step there always seems to be a next step a, a new uh improvement or innovation yeah, um, we're constantly looking for new and more minimally invasive ways. Um, eventually, uh, we, we may find that the surgeons are out of a job. Um, okay. So uh, hopefully not. Um, but um, microwave ablation is another one um, that's similar. Um, that also is used in different disease, in treating different disease processes. But we're just starting to sort that out for the thyroid. Again, um, the anatomic relationships um, uh, require us to do things a little bit differently. Um, so that is on the horizon. I think that's actually probably going to be um, favored more so than RFA for 
um, various... R- RFA being the radio frequency ablation. Right, yeah. How um, would the microwaves be delivered into the into the thyroid? It, it's um, a very similar concept. It's just different technology. Uh, okay, so these microwave pulses would also go through some sort of needle that's mm-hmm. inserted in. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So it seems like, in talking to you and others, that a comprehensive cancer center where you have these latest techniques, these latest equipment is the place to be for not just you, these cutting cutting edge top doctors, but for patients. Right. Um, I, I think it's um, exciting that, that we're the first in central Ohio to offer this. Um, like I said, this is something that is really starting to kind of take off among my colleagues around the, the country um, who are at similar centers in, in larger cities. Um, but the ability to offer this to our patients um, where we can uh, do things uh, safer and better um, is you know, what we're looking for for our patients. Now, are you someone who goes around the country and trains and lectures others and helps them to do, to do what you're already doing? So I'm part of the National Ultrasound faculty for the American College of Surgeons, so I do train train um, other surgeons uh, around the country uh, in ultrasound uh, and in fine needle aspiration. Right now, um, we're just getting started here with RFA, and um, so I'm not teaching that right now, um, but we've we've had experts come into our center and train us. All right. Well, well, thank you for sharing this really interesting and promising new technology. Thanks for having me, Steve. This podcast is brought to you by the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center, Arthur G. James Cancer Hospital, and Richard J. Solov Research Institute. For more information, check out our website, cancer.osu.edu.